Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon listeners, uh, if you bear me a minute, uh, let me um, share this video and I will start the program. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, today is Monday, the 19th of July, 2021, and the time has gone about four minutes to five in the afternoon in Birmingham, England. I am Suleiman Ben Suare, coming back on Facebook Live to discuss the um, state of affairs and to take lessons uh, from the troubles in South Africa. And um, the reason is there's a parallel between what is happening in the Gambia, uh, what is up, sorry, what is happening in South Africa, and what is likely to happen in the Gambia if it's not taken care of. And I would, um, I would, um, I would take on that briefly. And again, from there on, I'll move on to discuss the importance of transition after a dictatorship, after a warlike situation into a multi-party democracy and um, I will cite some countries as an example and um, the the other part we'll do is to look at some of the burning issues in the Gambia right now to conclude the program and um, if we when starting this program we will point on to the failure of governance we'll see the importance of governance people might be some people might just turn around to blame the behavior of the poor people of South Africa, but would not uh, see that where the problem lies in governance. And um, the other part would be corruption. People would not see the, um, the, 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 the role corruption and incompetency play in, 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 in ensuring the problems uh, happen. And the product of that is social inequalities. The social inequalities in South Africa, and thirdly, is the outcome of the their TRRC, their reconciliation uh, commissions, the outcome, the failure to, 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 to act on the recommendations. These are issues very important. As you can see, Gambia is grappling with the same issues. And I just point out what happened in Sanyang a few months ago, about, uh, or about eight months ago, was an indication I think it's in April actually. Indication what could have happened. And 
they do justice flares. They are undercurrents, burning within society. It was nothing to do with xenophobia. Remember South Africa started by people pointing to xenophobia when the undercurrent started to surface. They pointed to xenophobia. And um, there are many issues that, that, that causes the, the riot in Sanyang. Just as in South Africa, people will point to Zuma as uh, the arrest of Zuma causes the death. No, that's the fault line. That's the fault line. And there's always going to be a fault line that will be the catalyst to, to the problems. But there are always, uh, I mean, social undercurrents that, that and so And this thing only happened because of the failure of governance, because of corruption, because of incompetency, and which produces social inequalities. And that's what we see happens in South Africa right now. What I will do is, I have um, this uh, morning, I've read an article shared by Kuro City uh, from the New York Times, um, no, Washington Post. And I've took some extracts from the New York Post, and actually it's posted on my timeline, but to guide the discussion, because I don't want to deliberate too much onto South Africa. It's a long history, but I just want to use it as a reference point, as um, somewhere we can learn from, to avert the the the, um, the results that we see today in South Africa, and uh, the discussion will come on starting with the riot. According to the analysis from the New York Times, um, um, Washington Post, it says, "I quote: the recent riots in the country, two most populous provinces, reflect in many aspects a uniquely South African tra tra tragedy." But looking within the scenes of looting and violence, which saw at least 212 people killed and admit a worse unrest since the end of apartheid in 1994, is a broader global uh, parable. What happened in South Africa is what happens when the root, uh, when the gross inequality that shapes a whole society boils over, and it also what happens when a major political faction and influential leader prioritizes their own interest over the integrity of the country democracy. That's the first uh, extract. That's the first extract. And I want to uh, go back on the extract by um, dissecting it into three sections. And the first section will read, and I will analyze after. I quote again, the recent riots in, in the country uh, uh, the, the recent riot in the country, uh, two most province, um, um, populous provinces reflect in many aspects a uniquely South African tragedy. But looking within the scenes of looting and violence, which saw at least 212 people killed amid the worst uh, um, unrest since the end of apartheid 1994, is a broader global par parable. Just as I gave um, an example in Sanyang, when that happened, people point to selectively point to different issues. One, a xenophobia. Others point to say, I mean, uh, accuse the youths of being violent and rude or whatever it is. Others point to the presence of the fish mill factory, and and it went on and went on. But the underlying and problem or underpinning problems. Um, uh, reason is the failure of governance because all of those above is should be controlled uh, within uh, by government through policies and programs, but it failed. And the same thing happened in South Africa, and there's a history to add. That's why when we look at the transitions, the important of transition will identify that. It continued to say. Um, What happened in South Africa is what happens when a gross inequality that shapes the whole society boils over. The inequality. Why did we have inequality in South Africa with all the resources? And the economy of South Africa, the size of the economy of South Africa. Because this is the distortion. South Africa was under um, apartheid regime. 
and South Africa was class to be a first world country or on, on what a first world country. But because of people measured the country based on the system, based on the minority. South Africa was never based on the people itself, the, rich, the majority are, which are black people. South Africa would not have been I mean, classed as a first world with, with, with those inequalities and the system in place. But that's how people see things. They choose to give a narrative that suits them best. But any average South African would not have claimed to be ha been living in a false world. It was completely distorted. But they had an opportunity and came through a democratic means. And um, the biggest political party, the ANC, won the elections. Did they change the system in order to transform the life of South Africans? No. Now South Africa would be seen still in the same picture as a a first world country, but in reality it's not. What have they changed for South Africa? What have changed for South Africa? Yes, they have a black president, they have the majority black people in, uh, elected in office. That's what they have. But it's not Africans or South Africans owing or having a stake in their economy. It's not the condition of South Africans um, in, 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 in education. It's not the uh, opportun um, opportunity of South Africans in accessing jobs. It's not the opportunity of South Africans um, in, uh, having a better health care. It's not uh, in the change of South Africans having um, better conditions in the minds. It's not South Africans having uh, rights to their land. This none of the above. Then what change do South Africans have? Nothing. In fact, they got worse off. They got worse off because their expectations. They live in apartheid. They, their expectations were, were, were limited or, or, or measured. But when they have the freedom and they have their elected government, they expected to have a better life and way of living. And remember again, the NC came in to ratify the wrongs. Have they? Uh, we'll go on to two later. That's the TRRC they did. This which is essential in, in, in healing the um, country, investigating and trying to, uh, um, I mean, support the, the victims and help the perpetrators to account. <laughs> to level the playing field and so that people can equally benefit from the resources of the country. Did they do that? No. One thing they did, the elites of the ANC decided to have a policy that says that black empowerment to the economy, which was a lie. That was the empowerment of the elites of the ANC. Now that they can have shares or they can, uh, they, uh, companies have to sell a certain amount of shares or ownership have to go to black uh, South Africans. But who are those black Af South Africans at the ANC? Most of whom don't have the resources even or, 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 or the know-how to, 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 to be part of those companies or run those shares. But everything was politically um, distributed to the, them, the, themselves. The present president of South Africa was a leader at the mines. Within um, the time 1994 to now, he became a billionaire. A billionaire. A billionaire. But there's no Santi town, there's no province, there's nothing in South African black people that can say that they, uh, their lives, lives have been transformed. But not only him, the, the, the top, um, top uh, the leadership of, of the ANC are all millionaires and billionaires due to corruption and the people are in poverty. This is what causes the inequality. They have not done any reforms to change anything and everything stayed the same and they went to be corrupt and in order um, to provide for themselves, not, not the people. This is, this is part of the failures. And um, it went on. And the same thing can be seen in the Gambia today. Then we see the results of a four-year government of Baron. Did Baron not transform himself? but have not transformed any average Gambians to nothing. 
what have been transformed is the people that that followed Barrow in order to enter in him. They transformed themselves from nothing to what they are today. That's why they are desperate to hold on to Barrow. Because without Barrow, they would not be who they are today. Because it was not based on their potential, no competency or anything. It was based on that they can tell Barrow what he wants to hear. That you should be, you should continue, you should be this, you should be that. But we have seen the wealth, the opulence of Barrow and his family from nothing to, to where they are. And for people that keep on saying, but Hanan Nikki Walter, look, I should not even go there. Let me just move on. And um, that's the facts about it. And we have seen uh, the, the, the so called advisors and everything riding on their vehicles. Did the Gambia healthcare system change? No. The Gambia ed um, education change? No. The Gambia in, uh, people's um, um, and base, um, standard of living change for the worse. All of these things went for the worse, in fact, not for the better, not even to be maintained as it was. Job op opportunities, did it come up for the youths or guy of the Gambian? No. What are the opportunities for Gambians? Ne I mean, nothing, negligible, nothing. In fact, they, we got worse off in all those aspects. Who got better off? The borough and his cabal. This is the same parallel with South Africa. And we will still be wishful thinking that Gambia would just go, go on like that. It's not sustainable. And that's why we have this discussion to say that where it, it happened in South Africa and other countries, we're just using South Africa now because it's current. But other countries, wherever it happens, this is the result of it. This is the result of it. That's why when we discuss on our politics, we should do it sincerely. Because of we should be talking about what benefits the average Gambian, not what benefits the few. This should be the point of what our discussion should be about. But the, um, the, the post continue on that first section. It says, and um, it also what happens when a major political faction and the influential leadership prioritize their own interests over the integrity of their country democracy. I've already touched on that. Unfortunately, yes, this is the resource. They disregard every program that was meant to change the people. You cannot give handouts to your citizens in order to sustain them for better living. You have to, as a government, your responsibility is to create a conducive environment, an enabling environment. And, and an aspect of another thing that you do is to create a safety net for when people get desperate and needed support. You see, when people have ownership, given ownership of that country, of that economy, of, of the affairs of the state, people would take care of it because they have something to lose. But if people don't have nothing, no hope or absolutely nothing, why do you think they have, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, they would be they will behave or they will not react in a manner that's not progressive. This is what is happening in South Africa and this is where Gambia is going to. We have seen the flares. As I said, we have seen the flares in the riot in, in Sanyang. But again, we have seen it in the youth crime and, and drugs. And look at South Africa. Go and look at the statistics on youth crime and drugs in South Africa. On, on, on youth violence, on burglary, theft. Go and look at the statistics. Gambia, we have been seeing those statistics going up since the Adam Mubarak came to power. And it's not because of Yajame is gone, no. It's because of there is no gov effective governance. And effective governance, governance is not the, to take the stick onto people. It's to provide the enabling environment for people to meet their potentials, to create a safety net so that people would be, just, when they're desperate, they will have to support a support system and Gambia have the resources to do that. If we can have the resources to splash out, as we have seen evidently, anything that it's to um, entrench Adam Abaro, there is not lack of resources to that. We have seen the amount of money being taken away from the COVID funds, not to the hospitals or the people affected. We have seen the corruption in the agricultural department, in the fisheries department. We have the corruption every other place. And we have seen the opponent of Adam Abaro and the amount being spent to, 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 to win over people to his political movement. But not the investment to institutions, especially productive sectors that can I mean, I mean, guarantee the, the, the productivity, the growth 
of, 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 of the economy of the people, uh, of the nation, so that the people will benefit. We have not seen that. We move on. The uh, second aspect of the Washington Post segment I, I called it, uh, um, I mean, cited is, I'll, I'll quote and, um, and then uh, analyze it. It says, I quote, since 1994, the state has overseen serial uh, fail failures in ensuring preparation, rest uh, restitution, uh, rest redistribution, and, and prosecution. Non not not noted a statement from this is noted a statement from the uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation. Inequality has spiraled. This the this um, the discarded and despairing uh, lives uh, their living uh, lives li lives their uh, their lives with with conspicuous consumption in full vein. In what so uh, what somewhat. Uh, pugnant irony Sunday um, Sunday in the South African happening to mark the National Day uh, honoring the former president and le le uh, legendary anti-apartheid activist. It says that since 1994 the state have overseen serial failure in engaging reparation, restitution, distribution and prosecution. And recently, recently as last week we have seen the the um, the outcome of the reparation from the TRRC. We have seen or heard or lost hope in prosecution for 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 the perpetrators of crime, and the distribution of wealth have been evident that it has never happened in the four years of this democratic dispensation. That's a parallel to South Africa. There's a parallel to South Africa here now. What 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 is all this about? When they went through the TRRC, the the the, the, the uh, rep um, reparations, restitutions, prosecutions, they all fail. The government ha don't have the will because they already gone into bed with the perpetrators of the crime. All they wanted is to join them in. The 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 the, the apple, I mean, in the opulent way of life, there. How did they all become millionaires and billionaires within this short time as politicians? It's because of corruption. Now the Gambia, we have seen, we are seeing the same thing. Now with the TRC, who have hope that a better government will ever enact anything. We have seen the ridiculous amount being used as compensation or 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 or, or, or reparation. And again, the distribution is very important in this point. As Gambia is collectively been um, victimized, especially um, on economic grounds um, and, and on other social aspects. Investment was needed in society in order to redress some of these inequalities and some of this uh, hardship that Gambian people have gone through that could have done true land reforms, that could have been done through redistribution of the wealth and reinvestment of the wealth received from the loot from Gambia. Gambia needs that. Projects, community projects in every division in that country could have been sponsored. Social I mean, I mean, service or care or social projects, be it hospitals, schools, college, from the memories of, of our men, on the memories of the victims, of collective victims, or economical and social and culturally, what have happened to them. All these things could have been done. There is a lot of uh, things that initiative could have been done for Gambians to heal collectively. Not only what is given directly to, to victims, most affected, but collectively what is done for society. The investment. These are these are the ways a government should do and help, but literally nothing. South Africa have done nothing of such. Gambia is going through the same way. We are doing nothing of such. Instead, what is happening? Instead of giving reparation properly to, to that victims directly, we have seen now people. The policy. I'm not saying that the people in the APRC are responsible of of what happened. 
but they are the political party that represented the the, the, the government that that was in government these are the political party that represented the dictator now they have to take responsibility of that if they don't want that they have to disassociate with the aprc and the dictator but we have seen evidence of now the and, and this has been going for a while actually that the the barrow it's been quoting the APRC, it's given them more than the victims should, will ever think of receiving. From the refurbishment of their office in Koto and the recruitment of that office and paying allowances to, to members of the executive and everything else cannot be denied. And now the continued investment being done to the APRC. That's what we forgot. Instead of the victims, when the victims, Yusuf Mbaye, it's April 10, 11 victim who is now handicapped and sitting on the wheelchair, did not even have the treatment. And his life cannot, I mean, I mean, what, what can he do productive with his life without support? And the required support, the investment that is needed for him to able to be self-sufficient, not to be a beggar or anything. Did we think of that? No. Barak did not bother about those things. That's why if anybody supported state barrow you are supporting this injustice you cannot call yourself a good person supporting barrow and knowing that this is the injustice that is continuing this is the injustice that's continuing this is the inequality that is continuing in the country and the the uh, byproduct of this what's going to happen is just as we are witnessing today in south africa that's why i said let's learn from south africa we are seeing this evidence coming out it continued to say that these statements I read earlier to say that since the state have overseen serial failure in ensuring operation, restitution, redistribution and prosecution, that statement was made by the Nelson Mandela Foundation itself. That statement was not made by a white person, was not made by a foreigner, was not made by anybody else, but a credible institution like the Nelson Mandela Foundation. It's a factual statement, a statement we can rely on. That's why the journalists put that statement there. But again, we move on to the other aspect of it. Um, the I read again, I quote from, from the extract from the Washington Post. An, an, analysts everywhere, elsewhere have also warned about the toxic corrosion impact that economic inequality has on a country's political and social wit large. Over the long run, inequality has created a vicious circle, noted University of Oxford professor De, uh, Domingo Sanchez Anches. Uh, uh, Light income gaps between the poor and the wealthy have been one of the driven uh, drivers of violence. One of the reasons that Latin America is the region um, is the region with the highest homicide rate in the world. The violence is concentrated in low-income neighborhoods, creating anxiety and personal insecurity, and dis discouraging in what investment which might create jobs and improve services. This as, this is again a citation <coughs> by the author. Analyzing a statement made by a professor from Oxford University. And um, just listen to this properly. And I'm going to, um, I mean, take it in portions again and, and analyze. He says, analysts, analysts elsewhere uh, have also warned about the toxic corrosion impact that economic equality has on a country's politics and society uh, with large. Over the long, long run, inequality have created a vicious circle. Not, I mean, the inequality. We all have seen this evidence in the Gambia, just as we are seeing in, 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 in South Africa uh, and in other countries. Now, I mean, this professor have cited um, South America where homicide rates are highest and, and 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 due to this um gap between the i mean the poor and the rich and um this and, and he's um noting that these crimes are happening within the poor neighborhoods but again this poor crime rate is avoid i mean stopping investment coming into the country which could have i mean i mean help to, to elevate people from poverty by creating jobs and income i mean for the government 
We are seeing the same thing in the Gambia. As I noted earlier, since this government came into power, we have seen the gap between the poor and the rich. We have seen the gap worldwide. The inflation, the cost of living. Gambians cannot afford a two square meals anymore. You cannot afford from a Gambian salary. We have pointed today a salary scale for a Gambian government. A monthly payment of $1,200. Less than a bag of rice. The government putting an advert for a job and the monthly salary is, is uh, the annual salary is less than fifteen thousand dollars, which will work out. I mean, it's four, uh, it's fourteen thousand eight hundred and something dollars, which works out a thousand four hundred, uh, thousand two hundred and something dollars, less than a bag of rice. A government putting an advert on that. That tells you the government which is completely out of touch. How can you put an advert for salary less less than a bag of rice? That's not proof of our country today. We all seen the price. I mean, I mean, I mean the the, 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 the the price index from 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 upward thirty percent onwards. Basic, I mean, um, items cannot be afforded by Gambians anymore. We cannot buy fish or chicken or anything, or even eggs. Mayonnaise become a luxury. Mayonnaise become a luxury in our, in our country. Is that not a fail? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, economic uh, policy, inflation going up, but we have seen the the disparity here. We have seen how much the president spend a day, a day. That's we feeding the president, not his salary. His salary is intact. His allowances are intact. His pardon is intact when he travels. His medical bill family medical bill family scholarships and everything is intact but we are still feeding him i think that part of the constitution has to be amended taken off complete we should not feed anybody we all should be fed through our salaries then we can know the realities of of, of that country hundred and fifty thousand dollars a day the itemized we have seen the itemized 40 bucks of onions a month when Gambians cannot afford to buy onions, you can go through 40 bags. But these are the facts again. Now we see the crime happening in other areas, and we think that we can send the police, we can send the army to solve this crime. And again, that's why I keep on um, citing South, um, South America. Go and look at the militarized police. They arm to the teeth, they firefight and do anything. Go and look at the pavelas in, in Brazil and other places. When things improved in the pavelas in Brazil was when the socialist government came in and brought in socialist policy to, 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 um, to, to upgrade the people. When it improved in Venezuela, when the socialist government, it was unsustainable though. And that's why there should always be a hybrid. Make sure the, policy, uh, the, the programs are sustainable. Make sure the programs are sustainable. That's why we should not be just have a, a dogma policy of socialism or whatever it is. We have to blend whatever works. We have to be pragmatic. Where capitalist work, we have to borrow. Where socialist work, we have to borrow. But we cannot expect to force the people into deep destitution and we don't expect them to rise up against the people. And this goes off, up to Gambian, influential Gambians, privileged Gambians who are everywhere. In the globe, in the diaspora, but in the Gambia itself, in their enclaves, in their enclaves. Now they're turning their, I mean, their, 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 their houses or compounds into prisons. They will have to build higher walls. They have to put barbed wire. They have to put CCTV. They have to summon uh, higher guards. And these things could have been avoided by us, us participating in holding this government accountable, any government accountable, in participating in, in, in because, uh, be, be, be part of the system, making political parties better, the opposition better, making civil society better, empowering the other. The failure is not only a failure from Barrow, it's our failure collectively as a country. But that's why these elections are important for us to start the change. 
voting the right people in and holding them accountable. And we have to participate, especially the influence and minority. Every country progress is determined by a leadership, is determined by a minority. Yes, that's the fact. I don't have time to di I mean, digress on that, but uh, that's the fact. We have to spoke to that by then before. But if we expect people who can't tell from left and right to be the president and advisors to be everything, and we sit down and think that um, it's, uh, I am not in, involved in politics and everything, and you worry why you, you are not safe, your child is not safe, your wife is not safe, I mean, why the country economy is as it is, and, 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 and desperate. And when, when I mean, um, things I mean, go down south, you turn around to blame the politicians. What was your role in that? What was your role in that? I have to read a message, private message being sent. I'm going, not going to identify the... Uh, um, identify the person. But uh, this person said something. And the person is an elderly, this is very important on, on to what we're talking about now. He said, good evening, Saul. I sat and wonder why people don't make comments on such issues. With all the intelligent people, I left school in December 1957 after having passed the standard seven uh, school exam. I have never been to a high school because our own, uh, our own time, it's by age to admit it in a high school. But nonetheless, I sat to the TTC public exams and passed to enter Union College and was, and was in 19, 1960 class. I thank God that I'm able to contribute in the social media. Thanks for everything um, and, and your thumb. Good night. That's, that's what we expect. People who have a little to offer. It's not giving handouts to the poor. We, we want to redress these problems in order to have the conditions environment. The poor are not lazy, the poor are not stupid. They don't have an enable environment. They are hard working. They are working hard. But they should not base, base their work on luck. Should be a system in place that they can elevate them out of poverty. And if we have all these so intellectuals, we have all this no no aid, but you never see them participate. And we, they want to leave it to other people. And they expect, when we, they see the toxicity of, of social media, some, I mean, the, some, of, some of the less able coming out to insult or, 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 or use very divisive things, why, what do they expect? You think if they were participating and, 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 and drowning those people, do you think those, that narrative would have stayed? No. But we want to sit in our comfort zone and think that change will come. We should learn from South Africa because the change did not come to South Africa. I mean, the change come, but it did not transform the life of people. And change will have always come. And uh, the final analysis uh, continue to say the, the violence is concentrated in lower income uh, neighborhoods, creating anxiety and personal insecurity and discouraging inwards investment which might create jobs and improve services. This is what is happening in the country now, um, and that's where we, we are heading to. We cannot, we cannot just expect things to change because of a political party have win elections. It will not happen. That will take us to the second part of uh, what I wanted to present today. The importance of transition after colonization or after war and going into multi-party or, I mean, um, democracy. I'll do a quick analysis here for people to, under, I mean, and this is again to understand why is it important for this government to have gone through transition. But again, why is it important for the next government to go into transition mode to make sure we have this right? You know, when leaders participate in the process of governance, should be for the betterment of the people, should be to, to bring about change, to impact on lives of people for the betterment of those people, not to affect them. Should not be to affect them. The motivation to be in politics, motivation to be in leadership, motivation to serve your country should be to make things better. 
And that better cannot happen. If, if you have a mindset or think that that better is to impact on one sector of the um, country or tribe or region or anything. This should be inclusive. Any development has to be strategically planned in order for the into impact. Priorities have to be based on a matrix that is uh, to create the greater good. It's nothing to say that I am going to do it to advance a politica, my political uh, capitals. When those things happen, this is what happens. And we can see from uh, our, uh, when we had independence, this is for pol political capital, has ensured we failed and had the dictatorship. And the dictatorship came and entrenched him himself based on political capitals and divisive means. And now we have a time, we should, we manage to take the dictator out to have a transition. We fail to have the transition. Now we have the same person having the same tendency as the dictator and, and, and I mean, using divisive politics to so called projects to to entrain himself. That's not what we bargain for. But let's look at history, a quick one. Senegal. Senegal. There's lot of lot of Gambian sites in Senegal. And in most cases they don't have any history facts to back them their their, um, their argument. It's all is based on sentiments. All based some of them are based on a selective narrative they want because of they want to prove a point. Most if they look at the presence and they don't even understand the presence or they understand the presence but they want to take a particular ins uh, instance or context to, to, to make an argument just to win. Which is so true. Senegal as a country and every other country I'm going to cite have a history. And in order to understand people or a country we have to understand their history and their political history, social, political history, cultural. These things are very important. What makes this country this way? We have to understand that history. And this history would have to involve um, the, both the public and the, and the civil sector. And absolutely the private. But you can see the role that civil society plays to ensure a country uh, become a viable state or a progressive country. The transition of Senegal and, and every other country in Africa or developing countries, we should know the impact that colonization has on them. From slavery, colonization, which is continuity of slavery, is in a strategic way to where they are and the new colonist practice in order to keep those countries and to benefit from those countries. This is a fact we should understand. People that quote China and every other country have to understand the history of those countries. What they went through the Cultural Revolution, when they were, where, where went to, to the to, I mean, I mean, uh, leap forward. These things do inform why the countries become what they are. You have to go through certain processes. Unfortunately, unfortunately, for countries that have applied sensible measures, would go through the evolutions without being destabilized. But the countries that uh, refuse to follow the conventional wisdom of, of, of doing things, measured things, would have to be faulted in to be destabilized and most probably, uh, and in most cases, learn from those mistakes in order to become what they meant to be. And this is the Rwandas and other countries, Congos and Gambias and other countries are going through what they're going through in a different magnitude though. We're all seeing what happened in Rwanda. Go and find out the history of Rwanda, colonizations and everything else. I mean, I mean how it gets to where it is. Let's move on to Senegal. Senegal got their independence. And um, you know the French and the English, direct and indirect rule. And in very um, people call it direct and indirect rule, but in the outcome will come out the same. And um, it's all a control mechanism. And they all did one thing uh, the same, is that they create a division. They, even the people, uh, there are people that they, uh, they create a, a privileged class and an underprivileged class, class uh, from the same population. You cannot control people without dividing them. In slavery, we have learned that. When, when they capture slaves from different regions, they bring them into a central position. And they make sure they mix the slaves, people who can speak the same language, who don't be carried 
in the same voyage or if they carry in the same voyage they have to be carried in different compartments and women and children and, and, and mothers you see all these things are done psychological to control what was happening and that's how they get to the slave markets and when they're sold in the slave markets there are information that that dictates how they are sold and, and, and kept it's a system you have to have a structure in order to do these things and you have to have the capacity in order to do this thing and information in important to able to uh, do this thing. Senegal I mean suffered as other con I mean colon colonized countries did they have his the fisk they have to engage they had um, um, St. Louis and they have um, got it as the 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 the, the protect I mean as their as the um, I mean the, um, the what they call them again these are the the, the, the places that do, that were directly ruled by the French and technically the citizens within these jurisdictions were termed as French you can see the elites within the, the I mean Senegalese within this um, uh, within these environments and what does these environments have in common is the is the industry refuse to engage the industry and uh, I mean got it, the industry slavery and other uh, this thing the port I mean and go, same goes to that we have the same thing in the army we have the Bajun and the Combo Cape St. Mary's and we have the portrait with the province and Senegal the rest of Senegal was the portrait and that was the province up to Mali Mali was known as northern Senegal in in some documents northern part of Senegal and uh, and the southern part of Mali was northern part of Senegal and not southern part of 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 of, of Chad um, Sudan sorry southern part of Sudan this was important in order to control and they form an elite Dakar came about Dakar the capital of Dakar came about because of torn they turned the capital to be a service uh, service industry for for I mean that's where the garrisons were started from the garrisons and other things that's why Dakar came out as it is but what does in this impact have onto the people Senegal when went to through colonization and come out to independence and most people don't know Senghor was not to be the first president I think it was um, uh, pre pre Prime Minister Jack who was meant to be the first president and what happened there was called a coup d'etat and people tell you Senegal never have a coup d'etat but go and look at history again how Senghor became the president and you understand why the French prefer Senghor to be the president Again, this is to show, show you how manipulative the colonists were. And this legacy stays with us. It stays in our curriculum. It stays in our mindset. It stays in our public offices. And that's how we they, I mean, continue to trade with us. They dominate us. They, they update our policies. They do everything. Because of the mindset we have to update policies and everything is a mindset of our European in Africa. It's not the mindset of Africans for Africans. And this ensured why Senghor? Senghor was a Christian. Senghor was from a Syrian tribe. Because if, if you understand the culture of Syrians and, and, and Christianity, would have been uh, featured better. Now, the, they don't want Jah who comes from the north and from an Islamic thing. And if Jah would have become uh, a president, they feared that they could have lost control of Senegal quicker than, than they might wish. Then Senghor was a car prime and technically kind of candidate and Senghor transitioned Senghor to what uh, Abdul Juf and you can see. But the minute they have Ablai Wada, you can see the, in one form the deterioration of, of governance in, in certain aspects. But again, the moving from, from the, from the uh, French interest to other neo-colonist interests or their, their interests. Where, when uh, Senegal started to move towards policies towards America and other countries rather than centralized to, to France with their economy and other transactions. But you can see the reverse of that happening with, 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 with um, what, 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 what do you call him? Uh, with, with President Matissal. But the deterioration of governance continue under Matissal. Continue under Matissal because of what? This, the, this state capture. Because 
we can all remember that the two time was installed by Abdi Yuf due to the social un un unrest. The elections, I can remember the year itself, when the uh, election uh, in Vigilato was killed, I think it was Mr. Mbai or um, something like that, was killed from the World Bank, was assassinated and there was an uprising. And it was tense. And part of the negotiation and the settlement was it I mean, to reform the government to have a two-term in office. And Abdi Yuf came with the seven two-term office that gave him 14 years extra to serve. And um, Abdi Wada was co-opted into government as a state minister to settle the, the tensions. You see, that's governance. But that, that ensured even Abdi Wada came and technically tampered with the constitution in order to have a three term. And, and, and that ensured the Senegalese intelligentsia, the people I mean, the smart people of Senegal, that's why we need um, intelligentsia. Because of the game, the political game uh, Abdi, um, Abdi Wado was playing. The corruption, the, 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 uh, the cabal with him. But Macky Sall came out and become the anti-establishment, even though he came from the establishment. He ever been a prime minister, he ever been interior minister. But because of his background too, they thought he would be safer hands to give pass on the month, uh, this thing than, than the other opposition. But now we have seen him tampered with the constitution too, to bring out technical qualities so that he can go on. You see the deterioration of governance. The deterioration of governance. They had a successful transition, why? Due to the way the uh, French reorganized and, 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 and so on. This was a direct interference and um, compared to Gambia, where Gambia two people would argue that 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 um, I mean what we call it could have been, but was not an I mean I mean UP UP Pendia could have should have been the Prime Minister. But that was not a direct interference, that was a political move by a member of the UP cross capitalism to, to support Jawara um, uh, PPP in order to, to, to guide Jawara to, to, to form government. It was not a direct interference of the colonial. But in this way, the colonial ensured this happened. But not what underpinned this? Senegal managed to have a vibrant civil society in the form of their religious sect. And this religious sect, people can only people always identify the the Muslim sects as the um, the Muridia, the Tijania, the Lion, and the Hadiria as the most progressive or the only sects. No, even the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is very influential in Senegal and respected by the elites um, Senegalese because of the way they comport themselves. You see, influence is not only about size. It's about the content, your, your your integrity. Because of the church in Senegal, the Catholic Church put integrity in themselves. They hold on to themselves. Being a minority did not matter. They have influence. And that respect is accorded to them by government and people of Senegal. Especially the elite, the policy makers. But again, you look at the role this civil society plays as sex, the, be the nation, be the uh, tuba, be uh, the, the murid, be the lion, be everything else. What it does is, in the beginning, people see it as um, entrenching the government. No. In fact, in a very civilized manner, and this kind of institutions happen in the West, we fail to uh, recognize it in that manner. In, in a sense, they would say that they do interfere in the politics to a level because you cannot uh, um, you cannot rescue them from politics because of their influence. But everything was measured of how they interfere. Yeah, there there's some negative part of it, but majority is um, is is positive because a Senegalese can be a murid coming from different regions of the country. Senegalese can be of any tribe to become a murid. A murid can be any race. And if you become a murid, there's a solidarity. In, in the belief system, in the solidarity of in, uh, holding together of work ethics and everything else. 
The same goes to be a teacher. You can be of any race or any tribe from any region in Senegal. But not only that, they even transcend boundaries. They transform themselves to transcend boundaries. As, as you see, Muridia, which was uh, created in Senegal, have transcend boundaries into Africa and the uh, entire world. Tijania, which we come from the northern part of Africa, but Senegal took it and have their own strains of Tijanias. Not only one form of Tijania. They have the Nyesen who is a Tijania. They have, I mean, I mean, the the the, the, the people in in. Um, in the north of Kasimas, um, I mean, um, my fuller people, and you have the people from the Tal family, and you have the people in, 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 in uh, uh, and different forms in, in, um, the Czech Tijani, uh, in Tuawa, and different forms. And look at how they, how they export it. In most senses, people might not even realize that Tijani is from the north. They think that the Tijania is from Senegal because of the the uh, the, uh, the Marabu or the leader that they channel themselves to is based in Senegal. The the pilgrimage is in Senegal. This was part of what formed the fabrics of Senegal. Being it economic, do you know how much this Magal and this uh, Tariha brings into the country? I mean, bring be the stability, be the everything else. Yes, sectarian rivalry do happen, and we have all seen. And at times it becomes to a level, but it's always control. This is the success of what Senegal have, but that is deteriorated. Because the minute the, the, uh, the, policy, the public sector, the politicians started to interfere deeper, and, and started to bring out this division, is becoming a problem in Senegal. You go into Ghana, Ghana and Tanzania, and um, had their independence, English speaking, and technically choose not to go for a um, multi-party democracy. Because for their believing that if you go into political parties, have multi-party, people will be divided according to political party lines. Then the country will not be united and development cannot ensure. This was their thinking. But the, the, the downside of that is if someone is installed by a Politburo, by a selective leadership to determine the, his time in office, to determine his rule and everything, that's not democratic. And what happens? It creates a, a, an elite society and, and what it creates, that person will turn out to be a dictator because there is no old, other way to create a check and balance that is more effective than in a democracy where you have the parliament, where you have the separate government, the courts, uh, judiciary, and, and, and you have the press and so on. What happened in this sense that they will have to muscle the press because in order for them, in order for, for the system to work, they will have to um, I mean, not allow criticism or to be held accountable in any other form. They don't want another state to exist. They have to monopolize the power. Power has to be centralized. And this person will be the ultimate uh, power holder. But one thing is, now their focus is development. And in development in that sense, they will look at the inf infrastructure development. To develop all the infrastructure, to develop, to impact the life of people. This becomes their priority. They, they go in for them in education. They go in for agriculture. They go in for building roads and so on. And in most cases, you, have, you see such stories. And people will I and mean, give you the Akosombo Dam in Ghana. They give you the some of the projects that Kwame have put in the, uh, put down. But what happened? And people will say the imperialists overthrew Kwame. The people overthrew Kwame. The people overthrew Kwame. We'll get to that. But in Tanzania, again, the education again in Ghana at that time. And, and even now. But in Tanzania too, we see Nyerere education and other things. And Nyerere served his time and longer, he was never overthrown anything. What did he do better? These are things that we need to understand. But they went into transition in this manner and they came out that way. If you look at what happened in Ghana in a minute, we'll do. But you look at what happened in Tunisia and Morocco. Now again, you look at the historic um, comparisons, they are very similar. And in the sense of Morocco, they have a monarchy that the French leave in place. And in technically, <laughs> you can see the direct rule there, uh, indirect rule system 
when they leave the, the things and in Tunisia because of the wealth and the uh, resources in Tunisia and the Tunisia revolt to fight for their independence a prolonged fight of independence and the radical and the Cold War coming into it and everything else Tunisia is still destabilized because they failed to transition from colonial to, 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 to independent um, republic because of the interest of the, uh, the, the the colonials, they never imperials, they never wanted to let go. But in Morocco, they still influence uh, the Moroccan uh, policies and dominance. These are important things for us to realize. In the case of Ghana, something happened. They went on from that on. The coup d'état start and keep on going on till they have Rollins. And um, Rollins hold on to power. Why this coup d'état keep on going on? Because the, the, the people that took over could not centralize power. They could not hold on to power. Whenever they tested, they faltered, they go. And the economy was not performing and industries, this thing, people were not happy. Coup d'état has only happened and successfully happened due to the conditions, prevailing, prevailing conditions. In the case of Rollins, and this is why Rollins lived in Ghana and never been prosecuted. People saying, why we should do what Rollins Rollins never been prosecuted. You have to understand the contribution of Rollins, the impact Rollins have in Ghana, compared to the vandalism, what Rollins inherited. Rollins never overthrew a democratic government. Rollins have actually overthrown a government and passed it on and, and overthrown again. Rollins have not overthrown a country that was in order or anything. But you see the social inequality in Ghana then. Rollins, that's what saved Rollins. Rollins, the northern part of Ghana, was completely neglected because they are majority Muslims and, and they hold them as primitive and everything else. Rollins came out as a minority, as a, even a mixed race for that matter. But because of there was some in love of country, but as Machiavelli said, he was brutal, especially at the beginning. He was brutal. He he never went out there to to be loved first. He made sure he was feared first. He did some brutal things in order to instill the fear and put control. He was attempted many times. It never successful because of there was a counterbalance in, 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 in the country. And what he created by the counterbalance is to bring on, up the note, not on people, not on uh, price, in all the uh, uh, intergovernment and, and to prioritize uh, the, the economic growth and their I mean, give them privileges and, and, and priorities. This brought him the, that normality. And it and so he stabilized for from the farming and the, 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 the hyperinflation and everything that he took over from Hillary Liman. He managed to stabilize and, uh, the country. And he has never been seen living in Upland. Today, up to today, there's no Ghanaian paper or Ghanaian government that went and if the, when he was alive or dead to show you anything owned by Rollins, be it in Ghana. Or outside Ghana, his education of the key, I mean, children and everything started Ghana and they continue and on merits. And today, the children of Rollins are serving in that uh, in that country in uh, in the opposition. But not only that, he had an opposition party, and people thought every, the opposition party rallies around Rollins. It was not true, because after Rollins, the opposition party is still on. They never disintegrated as we saw when. Jawara left, PPP disintegrated. When Jamba left, APRC is disintegrating. When Sridiva left, NCP disintegrated. The difference here is to emphasize again the social inequalities. It's important to, to try to level this up. Not to, you have to, um, the expectations of people have to be managed. Because if you look at uh, the uh, people looking at Rollins, did not see the opponent. Yes, they see his heavy handedness and others. And other, some people at the time, in fact, accepted that heavy handedness. I call, I don't want to minimize it, brutality, you call it whatever, from, for others, but others saw it as heavy handedness. So others saw it as being necessary, which I, I did not 
subscribe to what I am just saying what others said. People see it as necessary as what? Saying that the same judges sentenced him to death. The same judges put injustice on him and wanted him to be killed. And he was going to be killed if he did not escape in the prisons and overthrow. Now he killed those judges. Some people do those comparisons, but it's never right to summarily execute anyone. It's never right to create a con con kangaroo court and execute people. It's never right. The due process have been followed, rule of law have to be followed. And capital punishment is never a solution to, to, to any problems. But these things happen. And Rollins managed to stabilize and, and hold on to this uh, Ghana. And Rollins was not forced out of office. Rollins did not run for election and lost the election. He went through a transition. You see, transition again, successful transition. He, he brought in the stakeholders, he negotiated, they negotiated, they made arrangements. You see, I'll tell you, if Yaya Gambe have considered defeat, you'll be surprised how forgiving Gambians are. Something else would have been said. But the, the APRC, Yaya Gambe have never admitted any problems, never asked for forgiveness, never, I mean, I mean did anything. But instead, still, have this sense of entitlement, trying to force people, uh, himself to people, this, these are the problems. But in this case, Rollins decided to leave when he realized that it's not sustainable anymore to stay on top of the Ghanaians. I have to give them what is right. And democracy came, came into Ghana. His party lost. And the, uh, the, the, the opposition came in two terms. The opposition lose after two terms. People saying incumbent. John Kafu lost after two times. You have, um, I think, Atamils. Atamils, I think, died. You have um, Maka, Makama. Makama lost to the opposition again. Now you have John, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, Ado uh, Kafu. You see? And when, when Atamils won, this Ado Kafu was the, um, the external affairs minister and run uh, on the ticket after the two times and he lost. You see, what did that tell you? The Ghanaian people decided to give up a I mean, chance again to the to, to the Rollins uh, Party, M, uh, MDC or I mean, I mean Democratic Party. Decided. You see, that's why we cannot look at what we have with the APRC and see and want to take excuse of Rollins over there in Ghana. We have to look at the transition itself and making it possible. Not only for Ga uh, uh, um, Ghanaians from the north to be part of Ghana, but to be to be seen, seen and respected, and now to be integral part of anything Ghana. And right now, the president, who is a Christian, ma married a second wife from the northern part, in order to. S to, I mean, to strategic to position himself. I'm not saying that they don't love each other, but I can tell you there's a political move there as well. There's a political move there as well. You see, these are important things we to remember. Why did I say this? Governments, governance doesn't happen by chance. It's through our sheer efforts. What we do inform the people and inform the system, hold accountability and ensure it happens. But Gambia, we just want to go on chance. Well, yeah, yeah, them, uh, um, Baroli, uh, the Daboli, Ali Fala Salali, and so on. That's the don't cut it. We have to be serious about this. It's not about the personalities. It's about what change can happen. We have seen Morocco. When Morocco became, uh, came under threat, this uh, Arab Spring, they went into reforms to reduce the powers of the king, uh, to give more powers to parliament and other issues, and, and economic pol I mean, policy change, and to create jobs and other things. It's not perfect, but it has kept the lead over the pressure. And that's what we talk about, an effective government. But what is the ideal? What is the ideal government? For example here, we criticize all this or point out faults here and give credit to others. We have great credit for Senegal and point out some minor hiccups there or at the present what is happening. We, we recognize Ghana, the improvement in education and other things that Kwame wanted to do. But again, it falters because, look, there, there was all sort of other undercurrents that were 
um, Kwame was not addressing and Kwame was becoming a dictator. This is what happened when you rely on the Politburo and, and this thing happened. Yes, the West, look, the West cannot overthrow you if your people don't want to be overthrown. We have seen that in Venezuela when the West wanted to overthrow Chavez. It didn't happen because of the people didn't allow it to happen. It's no other superpower that came in and stepped in. It was the Cuba, um, it was the, 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 the Venezuelan themselves that came in and stepped in. Um, we talked about this, uh, Tanzania and we've seen the um, foundation that Nyerere have built. And Nyerere has been an ex, uh, ex, I mean, a visionary leader in many forms and in investing in education and other ways he handled the differences. If you realize the differences in Tanzania uh, and the um, with, with the other islands around Tanzania, if you understand the slavery, I mean, uh, effect of slavery in Tanzania, the color, um, the, the issue about skin, colors, and I mean, many things. But Nyerere managed to put a lid on it and educate the people and engage the people more. And um, that's why um, Gambia, too, we should, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the island, and I mean, uh, Zanzibar, Zanzibar. And um, the issues with Zanzibar and how this, those things are handled. And today, we have seen a woman, woman uh, Muslim president in um, um, in Tanzania. It shows you, you the progress. Or is there's evidence onto progress or or not? The reason uh, um, Tanzania does not disintegrate. This is the reason. Look, I could have progressed this to go to Zimbabwe and give you an example. But it will take time of these things and we'll move away from Gambia a little bit. Let's go back to Gambia. What's, what's going to be the island kind of governance? It's inclusive. How can you have an inclusive government governance in a multi-party democracy? People will say that, but any political party that win will have all their people in every place. True, this is what is happening. But should not happen. Should not have happened. Because political parties are just a means to decide on on a um, um, I mean, a party to put into government based on their policy and how they convince. But when the uh, party goes into government, the party have a responsibility to govern for the entire nation. Yes, it's a I mean, it's a balance that the, that the government should have. What is party interest? and what overrules here, what should be the ultimate interest, the national interest. How does a political party do that in governments? Government will get to that. That's why I said we don't need to have an authoritarian ruler. We don't need to have a dictator in order to progress. And in fact, it's dangerous to think that a dictator or authoritarian will progress you. Rwanda is a matter of time. And other countries are a matter of time. The most ultimate uh, fact we know and evidence-based is a democratic nation and is likely to progress than an authoritarian rule and I mean in the long term. Um, we could have gone to China, I can give you some uh, um, evidence based some arguments on China, certain things happen in China right now and, and what it might look like in the future but that will take us away again. But let's come, on, come back to Gambia, let's keep it on to Gambia. Let's say people say that if we did not have multi-party, we would have been better off. Or having a multi-party, it's, it's why we are the people we are. We are divided. It's the interests. No, the problem is the people. What I mean the people, I mean the leaders. What I mean the leaders, I'm not only talking about the political leaders. I mean us. Every level of society, we have leadership. And the more, I don't want to use the word important. But priority based in a sense of this argument is uh, the higher the office or uh, the, the, scale, uh, the scope of, of responsibility you have, that's basis of your importance. The president is higher in the office and the scope is national. The ministers, they have departments. Alcalos have commun uh, community leasing. They are all important. But we just give them priority. It depends on what the scope they have to deal with and um why i said inclusive how do you attain inclusivity in a, in a multi-party state and this is something that political parties should think of now and i think it should be a selling point for, for any political party how do you address the 
uh, unity of diversity as a strength and in, in, in governance. And um, in this sense, let's go back to Gambian history. As I said, in history, Gambia was dealt with a bad cat as every other country. And this ensured what we attain our independence based on going through a multi-party democracy. That's what we choose. People uh, and say, that, oh, because multiple. No, we choose multi-party. Progressive. Other people choose something different. Senegal people choose multi-party. But as I have said, the intervention of France to ensure there was this kind of a control mechanism, making Senegal be there in order for them to continue to control. There's a control there. But in the Gambia, technically, we, we did it for ourselves. And by default, we have a political party, two political parties. One was the PPP that came from the province because of the way, again, the country was divided. The people in the province were not represented. They didn't have a direct uh, elections of their representative. But for, for almost two decades, or three to four, the Cape the, the, Banjo, uh, the Banjo and Cape St. Combo St. Mary area used to have elections and they elect their own representative directly, councillors and others. Political parties were ex exercising there from uh, different political liberal and, 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 and conservative party within this jurisdiction. But the, the people from the rural, once they come into these areas, they participate in the elections, but people with that base in the rural never. And you can see now the division between rural and urban. Now, when we have multi-party, the people from rural decided they want a representative. You see, straight away, that's the division. That's not inclusive, but it's not to be our fault. That's why we learn history to find out where we gone wrong to rectify that. It should not continue. The fault, they, even the name of the party says it all. People progress, uh, people Portrait Party, the People's Portrait Trade Party. It's, it's, uh, it just tells you all. We have the United uh, United Party, uh, UP. I think it's called United Party, if I'm right, UP. UP came out from default as well. Because at that time, all these parties that existed, the Gambia Muslim Congress and every other party, liberal parties, that, conservative parties that existed, were just small parties formed um, I may recall it, uh, local government elections. Now, UP came out from an uh, intellectual base, and people call that an elite. Because if you realize at that time, if you realize at that time, the likes of Pen Jai been that educated for an African, even today, tell us, we all be proud to have uh, that sort of education. But not was only pair. Even pair's brother was equally educated and other siblings. Just tell you how elite you can see. It's not an offense. I'm um, don't take me wrong. I mean privilege, and and they have this, and they have been privileged for a while for them to have to study and do things for themselves, and we should, we should be proud of that. They achieved that. It was not given on a plate. But that's that's a fact, though. But that fact would be seen in order or in in a different light for other people. Then we have the UP, and the UP technically came out with those small parties that were already in existence that are privileged to be given that privilege by the colonials to practice uh, politics, to form the party. And obviously, another thing they did was, remember, because of they were from the urban, they have influences, the influences of what? In the rural. They, they traded, they, they did host it, families from the rural and everything. They had their support base to channel through those influences. But none of those parties were formed to say that we will have will from UP. PPP was not formed to say we, we Mandinkas will from PPP. PPP was likely, likely, even fuller base. If you look at the level of executive they had in the time in the rural areas. You see. That's, these are the facts we should point out. It was not tribal base. But the leadership, people identify with the leaders, especially in, in um, uh, even in the UK here. I'll tell you, a leader of a political party would matter. 
not only the party policy, who becomes the leader matters. That's why they look at a sellable, winnable candidate. In this sense, too, the local people have looked at the leaders. Pianja is one of an elite. Uh, Jawara is Mandinka from this thing. And uh, again, let me apologize for this. But Jawara have even said it. In some quarters, they're calling him Ude. And Ude, like uh, a blacksmith or something like that. Even that's, that's this, this where the fact. The discrimination was not only tribe, caste, it was of different magnitudes. We live with through that. But the PPP won. And remember, for people that didn't understand the elections we have before, it was not a presidential election that people vote for the president. No, people vote for their members of parliament in different regions. Every political party have their candidates. And they vote for their candidates and they came, uh, put it together. Just like we have what we have in UK, the party that have more candidates would be uh, more, more parliamentarians would, uh, would form government. And the PPP was actually less by less one. And I think this particular, I don't want to name the person and emphasize because I have to remember, um, I'm not sure, I think I have it right, but probably someone else know better. The person was um, a chief and nominated to be in parliament. And that person decided to switch his vote from UP to PPP. You see, it was that close. It was that close. One part, member of parliament switched allegiance to PPP and Jawara have to form government, not Penja. And Penja was disappointed. But what ends up after that was the problem. Jawara went on to progressively think of, but based on politics, to strengthen his party because it's not sustainable. It was one seat it turned around. Now, in order to be strengthened, Jawara thought of transforming the party. I mean, the PPP thought of transforming the party. And how did they transform the party? They called the party the People Progressive Party. Instead of the People Progressive Party, People Progressive Party. And guess what? They entice the members of parliament from UP to cross carpet in order to be in parliament. Now, if you see this coming from the APRC now, cross carpet in, in order to have back of rights, I mean, I mean, I mean, Hadi Tobaski, uh, uh, advisor position, ministerial position and others. Where did it start? It's in our history. It's in our history. When you are scared to be in opposition because you have nothing. Now, opportunists, uh, politics of opportunism um, was invented. That's where we feel. If PPP have decided to see that, say that we have won the elections now, but Gambia have won these elections because we went through negotiations and had our independence, so now we did this. Now we want to build that foundation. If Jawara have reached out to the UP and give them, let's say, there were, let's just argument say there was eight cabinet positions, and give them three cabinet positions, and identify even the people that they want for that cabinet position, to go, come and join the government. You see that unity of purpose, and this would be the best because there are no enough technocrats, there were no enough politicians of, of high caliber to, to run cabinet office. But they could have made this thing happen and the best would have come into government. It didn't happen. But this practice of opportunism continued. Continued. And I can give you, uh, indulge you in our history again. It continued to the extent that Gam you don't have you don't want to that's why when any pol opposition that ever existed in the gambia cannot be powerful cannot be empowered because of the the story is that you go opposition bugulo dara now the mindset of gambians is so many opposition than expect poor and dara you know and this thing was wrong the mps were suffering you become an mp and you, because you are an MP, your constituents will come to you. They have ngente, they have ditch, they have everything. They expect you to give them, you to to do it. The, now the responsibility of MP was not understood anymore, and MPs think that they have to do this, and that again affected our politics. You see, we failed our transition. But let me give you another history. Buba Bande, 
Bubo Balde wanted to run to be, because you have to be a member of parliament to be in a minister. Bubo Balde wanted to run for office, want to be a minister. Um, and um, he was actually running a project, uh, Freedom from Hunger campaign. He was very popular. But naturally, may he sold rest in peace, he's a very charismatic person. He's a very outgoing person. He's a very friendly person. And he was really, uh, apart from that job, he would have been really. Uh, a, f a brilliant candidate anyway but having that job running the freedom for, from hunger, hunger campaign within that environment give him a plus but Bubba Balde wanted to run the prim, prim, the, day, the PPP did not select him and he ran independent and he won the independent and went into parliament there was a parliament rule that if you miss if you miss three con 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 <laughs> if you miss three sittings of parliament without, I can't pronounce that word, three sittings of parliament without, without uh, I mean, good reason or, 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 or permission from the, um, from the speaker, you will lose your seat. Now, then Asamusa Kamara, uh, this election was 19, I forgot the elections. Asamusa Kamara had from a party. And now, the PPP don't want to dismantle, marginalize um, Asan Musa GPP. And the area that they really, uh, Asan Musa had line was Kantora and Basia area and so on. And um, the PPP wanted the seat. They wanted the seat that uh, Buba Balde have. Buba Balde was independent. Because now, PPP wanted to appoint Omar Si from Basia to govern, I mean, to cabinets. Because Amasi was not a parliamentarian, to make him a parliamentarian, to bring him a cabinet, that would have, you see, political capital to win the government confidence of people from Basi. And that would have taken the, pulled the rock off of, of Asan Musa. Um, Buba Balde um, traveled to Freetown and deliberately stayed away from parliament for three um, cities without writing or anything. And obviously he would have lost his seat. He went he lost his seat. Who got his seat? Then uh, Omar Omar C contested the seat a by election. Who campaigned for Omar C? The person who lost his seat, that's Buba Balde. Because the arrangement was Buba Balde took took I mean I mean I mean, con I mean support the uh, support the candidature of this thing and the elections come, Buba Balde would be given a seat to contest and if he wins, he will be a minister. That's what happened. Buba Balde campaigned for the person who took over his seat. Omar Si won. Omar Si became an external affairs minister. Uh, Buba Balde stayed and waited for the elections. Election came about. Buba Balde went as a PPP candidate, won his seat on, in a different constituency and Buba Balde became a parliamentarian. And parliamentarian and minister of youth sports up to the coup d'etat 1994. That was the election before 1994. Now, we created from the First Republic this politics of opportunism. Now, you have to gravitate towards person in government. Now, because of the ignorance within society, it's easy to do anything just to get in government and everything will be cozy. And you'll be accepted because the mindset is government, which is which is wrong. Now, but the, what it affects is affect our governance. It affects our transition. What this opportunity, um, um, the the um, the, the 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 politics of opportunism created what incompetency created what corruption. Now, all you have to do is show loyalty to the PPP. All you have to do show loyalty to the PPP, I mean, for jobs and other things. Yes, competent people were appointed, but now they started to have incompetent people. Now they started to have all these things. And even the competent people started to be corrupt and complacent. Now we started to have this corruption going on and, you know, and started to create social unrest, uh, social inequalities and so on. And now the little, and in those days even, ministers don't have much. But in the eyes of the people, it was much. The social inequalities again we talk about. And remember, it always has to be around the Bible and Commerce and Mary for people to see. And 
this is what and so we, we remember the agricultural De development bank collapse the uh, gpm uh, jpmb collapse the the the, the, the cooperative union collapse the 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 this um the Gambia commercial bank collapse you know the NC, uh, ncp and uh, ntc collapse everything collapsed and nobody paid for it and custom officers become multi-millionaires overnight nobody ever going to prison for that nobody ever going to trial for that you see this is how we got to where we've been because we failed in our transition now that's why it's important for this government to and this time around we have a transition and we are failing on transition that's why i bought us here what should happen today if i was to advise any political party come out and announce that when you are going and hopefully when you win that election you are going to be inclusive inclusive in what manner yes political appointments will happen because it's politics and political party goes into government and they will be political don't lie to people let nobody lie to anybody but tell them that the national interest will not be compromised in appoint given appointments that the critical industries of that country the critical sector of that country and every appointment will be measured based on merit and the best of Gambians will be considered for any uh, position. It's not going to be based on political party. Loyalty. And if any government comes in, any political party wins an election, put it, base it on that. You will see the productivity of that government. You will see the effectiveness of that government. And you see that reflect to society itself. Then the talk of tribalism, the talk of uh, cronism, the talk of every other thing that we perceive uh, 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 as a problem or which are problems would not happen and the corruption would be minimized. That's the only way. But if we think that we have to, okay, when we win, we, who winner takes it all? That's what it continues to be a, a politics of opportunism. And if we have this politics of opportunism, this is what it creates. It creates a government that's not transparent, a government that is corrupt, a government that's incompetent, a go government that's not inclusive, and a government that's not effective. And in lack of that e effectiveness, create the social inequalities, it, it, it creates a divided society, and people will be at, uh, at this order too. Why do we have these problems in Africa? This is why we have the problems in Africa. Furthermore, now I want to move on to the some of the burning burning issues, the current issues in the um, in the in the Gambia. And I will start with the uh, fertilizer scandal and another fertilizer scandal and Barrow's statement on not prosecuting the people recommended to be prosecuted in the Jana Commission. Technically legalizing corruption. Now, if you take care, now you can see the parallel where I'm coming with this program. I started from South Africa and explained, I came through to explain transition, the importance of transition using example of other countries and coming to the history of the Gambia, political history of the Gambia. And for the people that, um, <laughs> I don't want to go in there. It's a bit controversial. Let me leave it. But that's another political history for another day. Why the Gambia abolished the death penalty? If any PPP steward come out to raise the human rights or whatever this thing, it's not true. It's not true. It was to favor an individual who have killed, who have killed another person. And because of that individual was privileged, they don't want the dead parent to apply or even the person to stay in prison. They cooked up the justice system and that person was freed and the next day that person took a flight and came to the United Kingdom. And the person killed and their family have never, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean um, have the justice that was required. And you see, if we tell you the reason for the, there's uh, many reasons that it could be successful, these are the things. And we have to learn from that. We'll do that another day. Because I don't want the 
AP asks you to hide that, that statement and to use it for Yankuba Ture. If they think they know the policy of Zambia, let them go and recite that bit. I've not given, I've not given it to them for free. Now we come to this issue about this fertilizer scandal. Um, Baro and Baro made a statement that the reason he's not prosecuting the Ghana Commission guys is not to the state interest. You see, these things have two things to do with it. This another fertilizer scandal. What happened to the other fertilizer scandal? The Ministry of Agriculture was accused. The minister was accused. And the minister, Oyegaro, did I mean, refute the allegations. The government constituted an investigation, uh, constituted an investigation to the, via the police. And the police carried out the investigation and exonerated the minister. They said the minister have no hands in this corruption. But the permanent secretaries, and in, I think two of them, or one of them at least, I remember, Musa Jalo. Is it Musa? I can't remember. Jalo. Minister Jalo. No, Asan. Asan Jalo. Asan. Musa is the brother. Asan. The either two permanent secretaries, or, or one permanent secretary, I remember, Asan Jalo, and other directors or, work, I mean, more workers or so, within the ministry were responsible. This was an investigation. And the investigation recommended a prosecution. The investigation recommended a prosecution. Did we have a prosecution? No. Where is the permanent secretary? I think he's back to agriculture. If he's not back to agriculture, he's still in government as a permanent secretary. Where are the other people? They are still in government. What does that tell you? You legalize them in uh, corruption. Why? Because you are corrupt yourself. You That's what you thrive on. Now, this is the same person that says the prosecuting Mambure Jai and orders will be tantamount to, um, to the national interest. Where is the justice part of this government? How can a government promote impunity and say that it's not interest to the country? You see, and people think that Adam Abaro is a fool. In some instance, he's a fool. But in other instance, he take that excuse to play on to the Gambians. Adam Abaro refused to prosecute because of he benefits from the corruption in that country. Because of the people that he brought into government, Mambure, Elijah Sisi, Tangara and others, the, all these people are, are known criminals. And now, he will not want to prosecute them because they are helping him I mean, to, 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 I mean, uh, to, to, to loot our coffers. From the Bayon project and everything they do, they help him to do that. Yes, he will not prosecute Asan Diallo because Asan Diallo's wife is his mobilizer. Women's mobilizer, Maimuna Balde. And Maimuna Balde is related to his second wife. You see? Nepotism, cronism. But no, we go and shoplift us or pickpockets or whatever crime anybody else commit, we, 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 we take them to prison. But the big corruption that even probably caused those other people to steal would not go to prison. Is that not social equality? Inequality? This corruption did not, did, did the corruption not cause social equality? Now, that prosecute, that fertilizer crime was not prosecuted. You and you are surprised that this fertilizer um, is going on, crime is happening, or other corruption are happening. Every corruption would, every corruption would just ensue. And if you vote for Adam Abaro, you are voting for an approval of his records, and that means more of what he have done. That's that's easy. I tell people all we can do is to tell Gambians, and they is up for them. They, they, we are living the realities. We Gambians are living the realities. But we still have to engage each other. Now it's up to us to what we do. But I am telling Gandhians too, the social inequalities, if Adam Abaro steal these elections, because Adam Abaro cannot win these elections without stealing these elections, the evidences are clear. What comes to us, we are not to blame anybody but ourselves. Because I'll tell you, there is a ticking time bomb. And we all see it. We saw the riot in Sanya. And I'll tell you, the youths 
in that country. Most of them are desperate, are hopeless. That's why they're taking the back way and doing what they do. But that's why they're committing these crimes and everything. They have been failed by society. That's why we have this level of drug addicts and criminals and everything. We have to take response order. And you think that if social unrest happened because of some people came out to protest about the elections, you think those yeah, those youths would be going to protest about the elections? No. That's an opportunity for them because they have the people protesting, taking the attention of them. Now the police and everything would be on the protest and they will come after you. They will come after our businesses, they will come after our homes, they will come after our vehicles, they will come after the, anything they envy, anything they want to aspire to, anything they want to do. Because that's the only thing they know. This is what happened in South Africa. This is what is happening in South Africa. There are people going out genuinely to protest and they are protesting for what? For their own teeth. Because of the pluralism in politics, the Zulus and the Encarta movements and this thing, they are protecting their own thief. They know that uh, Zuma is a thief, is a criminal, but they don't want their thief to be prosecuted. And knowing that that thief and criminal, in fact, did not benefit them as a tribe of religion, but he benefited himself by building 300 million homes and whatever it is. By allowing Asians to come to South Africa after 1994, the Guptas and work with the Guptas to capture that state and, and, and made of, uh, to become billionaires. But, and you see the ignorance of the people, they will still go and fight for that politician. That's why I'm saying these Gambians, I've said that those privileged Gambians, us that can afford the mansions, that can afford the buildings, that can afford the four-wheel drives and everything. If that day comes to reality, I'm not begging for it. Know that we are not going to be safe or secure. It's not going to be about Adam Aparo. It's not going to be about government. It's not. It's going to be about our own um, permanent, I mean, immediate safety. Another issue we should be careful of. This corruption would lead us to what? If we happen to have a failed government there and protests happen, that armed forces is toxic. I'm not saying everybody is, but generally as an institution. And you did not only hear it from me. You used to hear it from me. But I am going to quote the CDS that came out and admitted a division based on tribe. It's not me anymore saying it. It's the CDS that came and said it in front of soldiers, said it in front of the press and we read about it. Well, why are we behaving as we are not seeing the realities in the country? And we want to keep quiet about this. And I have seen journalists writing about this story and say, not even mentioning the minister. It's not even fair to the whole cabinet. Why not mention the minister the number defined or name that been mentioned? But no, we were just making a passing decision. But all these things are going to affect us. But Adam Abaro saying that not prosecuting these people is just confirmation of impunity. That he would never. Adam Abaro cannot talk about corruption, will not talk about corruption, will not deal with corruption. Because he is ultimately corrupt. We have seen the proof. We have seen the proof, the evidence out there. From the property in, in, in Seattle to the properties bought in Fajara, in Bakau, in Makamakunda, everywhere else. Talending and everywhere else. The shops been run and everything. Businesses been operated and, and now the nephews. Amadou Sane and, and Jaga, the nephews now become tycoons overnight. Overnight. And people will want to tell you where's the evidence of corruption. How can we justify that uh, level of opulence at this short time? Even Jammeh took him a little bit of time. That's one, one of the issues that we need to tackle and think about. And know that this corruption is what is keeping the people poor, keeping the people not even able to afford the basic common, I mean, necessities in life, stopping the investment that's supposed to go to our schools, investment to our hospitals, investment to everything else. Did Adam Barrow care? Did the people around him care? No, because the wives and families are going to hospitals, private and different hospitals and airlifted. Their schools are not, uh, the kids are not going to the same schools and the market, they are not going to that market or the prices in that market doesn't affect them. It affects the African Gambian. And you think that when crime happens or, or, or violent or uprising happens, you have to blame a political party for that? We don't blame ourselves for allowing this to go on. 
this is a collective res uh, man, 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 responsibility we have. Collective responsibility we have to hold Adam Abarro accountable. If Adam Abarro dare to do this, because we are so much divided that we have to look the other way because of Adam Abarro is doing it. Whoever does it, our who, who oh, everybody defend their own own thief. Just a minute, let me check this. Hello. Sorry about that. This is the problem we have. We look the other way. You see, this is the fertilizers of one corruption. But imagine if we continue to steal that what makes the cake. These people are not even making the cake and steal. You see, that's what corruption, how bad these people are. Incompetent people, this is what they do. If they had made the cake and steal a portion of the cake, or what do you say? You milk the cow and steal the milk, but they will kill the cow and eat the cow and eat the carcass of the cow, and there will be no cow to be milk or anything else. The same thing they're doing. They are stealing the fertilizer, and this is the only one uncovered. It's going to happen everywhere else. Uh, and when they steal this fertilizer, now the fertilizer is not going to the farms. How do you expect to develop your agriculture? How do you expect to develop your agriculture? That's what I mean by my post. They are stealing the ingredients that goes into making the cake. Go and look at the corruption at the port authority. Go and look at the corruption at the airport. Go and look at the corruption everywhere else. That's what it means to serve government. And I, 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 I been very fair. I gave you the perspective. I give you a history of it from the First Republic and and how it was entrenched by Yajamen. And one thing Yaya Jame did about this corruption was he was ultimately the most corrupt. And anybody who was corrupt would be under his um, blessing. Anytime he wants you, he punish you for it and take it over from you. He was like a, just a bigger criminal. And you see people, uh, some people who even earn their money legitimately were scared even to develop themselves. Because you don't want to drive a vehicle that Yaya Jema will see and punish you. For not even, you might not even have anything to do with government contracts or government. A private individual will be framed. Or, or you build your house, you see people build their houses and they will not complete, they will leave the fence and everything covered and not show a complete building. Because they don't want Yaya Jema to envy them, Yaya Jema to come after them. This is what we live through. But now, Every thief is free. Baro become the biggest criminal as Yajame and everybody else become a bigger thief. And even some of the thieves are bigger than Baro. Because Baro thinks they control those thieves. Mambure, uh, uh, um, all these other people in uh, in that place. He he realized that Henry Gom um, Furmus Gomez, Bailan and Job, uh, Mambure, these critical ministries are even wealthier than he is now or are that wealthy because he thought that they were just enabling him to to be corrupt and they have a little but in fact they were taking the largest share he knows about this but he dared not take them or do anything where's Ahmadba? Ahmadba took a portion of it with Musa Dhamma and others go and look at the TDA go, go and look at the projects of uh, of those so-called projects that meant to be to, to, to for the tourism go and ask the hundred million for the tourism uh, um, um, COVID relief fund where is it gone Amadba is gone quiet and Amadba is expecting Barrow to continue he cannot even campaign for Barrow because they've fallen out his, his party is technically even no more but he is doing this in thinking and, and next minute Ababa will place himself for the next government not to prosecute him. Because of Ababa understand the cycle of Gambians. He's trying to play the cycle of Gambians. That's why he's quiet. He's no more shouting on Gambians. Because he can see the end now. We move on. The other issue is the APRC. <laughs> Dig the debacle. Uh, the spokesperson uh, making his um, declaring himself to be supporting Barrow, and which is sounds very stupid to say I am hundred APRC. Uh, this is what I'm going to support Barrow. I'm going to campaign for Barrow. What does that, what does that tell you? What's the, what does that tells you? And the other thing I'm going to touch along that line would be the Tobaskill Ram 
given to the APRC and the vehicles. Why is this important? For people that follow my program, for how long I've been telling you that APRC would disintegrate. How many times did I tell you that APRC is Yaya Jame? And Yaya Jame is going to hold on to. I can, let me. Some people have seen this document before. Let me just go to the document and I'll read the document directly. And that document was written two years ago. I did my analysis of the political uh, uh, of politics of Gambia. Let me just see the person. I uh, actually looked at it today because of the. Uh, I have to read. I'll read directly. Okay, this is what's my, I'm not going to give everything away, let me just see where I want to start with. I say the party was founded as, as the evil political machine of the dictatorship, and it still only represents the legacy of the dictator. Apart from the uh, clueless politicians throwing the party a lifeline, thinking that the party can be used to prop up their political party, parties. Also, the spinless people within the party executive are another distraction or a distortion of normality. They have zero control of what happens with the party or what decision, uh, what decision the party takes. The dictator is holding up to the party as, uh, as a lifeline for his possible future bargaining chip. He is holding on to the base of the party, which is mainly made of I don't want to put on that. Um, a, a few distorted uh, benefactors and few distorted benefactors of the regime. The more it becomes clear that he is not in the equation, the majority will move on with their lives. This is the only reason the dictator keeps sponsoring the homecoming rallies and using social media in inspire the grassroots, keeping them relevant, himself relevant, and trying to control the narrative to be part of the present future political dis discourse the discussion. Let me give you another party here. The NCP. I won't even bother with the NCP. Um, let me give you the PPP, the People Progressive Party, what I wrote about them. This is from a document, as you can see, it's from a, a, an extensive document I've written. I'll read from this. The original, the original PPP was gone with Jawara after the administration was deposed. The present PPP has no sound structure or capacity and the resources are relied, uh, are relied from the president. The party was legally registered during the dictatorship and um, continued to register to during the dictatorship, but only recently existed in official documents. The interim leader, Oye Jalo, fought to keep the party relevant, especially within the inter-party discourse. The party had not contested in elections since coming to power in the Second Republic. They held a few small political rallies during the tail end of the dictatorship, which I don't want to mention the in brackets. I have never heard of a political party congress held by the party during the 22 years of the dictatorship and apart from their interim leader, I did not know of any active member of the executive. They had no real, um, I mean, cons um, they have no real political constituency. The APRC and the UDP had consumed their previ previous support base, but I recognize the relevance of the party leader in the political discourse. He has literally uh, been the only member of the former cabinet to stay on course fighting against the dictator. 
During the 27 parliamentary elections, the party only managed to win two seats in Banjun with the help of a coalition, I mean, ta, uh, uh, Tahawal Banjun, with a very narrow margin. In 2018 local, local, local elections, the party performed worse and got less exposure uh, due to the absence of a coalition campaign. They are feel, uh, they are feeling few council seats. They felt, uh, f they were feeling few council seats sits nationwide and had no candidates running for mayor or chairman. They managed to win only win one councillor seat in Banjun South out of all the seats they have contested nationwide. In November 2018, the party was forced by the IEC to hold their par uh, party congress according to the Electoral Act. In, uh, interestingly, the IEC had never exercised this power during the dictatorship as these parties were cons considered as the threat by the uh, by the uh, I mean con uh, the by the dictator, but in fact this this party we are not considered by accepted by the dictator, but in fact this party uh, they help make the un uh, unity uh, united coalition on un unachievable. The party applied for an extension on holding the congress, but the IEC denied their request. They had to comply or face the, the registration. They held the Congress on, 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 on unveiling Papa Njai as the party secretary general and the party leader. Papa was a former independent candidate at KMC local government election, also a former contest, contestant for the UDP at the KMC mayoral candidate. Honorable Bibi Dabo was the opposing candidate. His campaign, uh, campaign, campaign cried foul and accused the then interim leader of conducting a fraudulent election by getting uh, unregistered members of the party to vote for Papa Njai. They petitioned the elections and the winner uh, 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 and the winner to the court. I mean, uh, winner. The case is still ongoing at the courts. This ensured a split in the party. Bibi Dabo and his supporters went on to form the G G GAF political party. The PPP has still not addressed the acronomy, uh, 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 agronomy and has not heard any political activities. Uh, political observers noted that the, uh, the party is an extension of borough plan planning on creating a mushroom of political parties as the party leader is a relative, uh, the party leader is, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, has have a relationship with Baro. Mr. Oj or Omar Jalo is harboring bitterness towards the UDP and being financed by Baro. The party is very insignificant to, the co to be considered in any calculus in the political dispensation. It is a, it, it is a group of people controlled by Omar Jalo for his personal interest. They have no grassroots and the members of parliament, uh, parliament can only maintain their seats on their own credit. The party has zero capital. They will fail the IC audit if the IC happen to carry out a credible exercise. This was my prognosis. This was mine. And I can tell you every political party here. That's relevant. But as I said, what I did, what I do with um, existing political parties that are effective in opposition is to consult them behind the scenes and advise not to come against them because of they have an incumbent to deal with. And why do I do that is to level the playing field. You cannot go on attacking the opposition and expect, I mean, the, the democracy to thrive in this sense. You hold them accountable by reaching out to them, hold them accountable by giving them advice. Until they commit a crime, then, then you hold them, I mean, I mean, criticize them for that crime. But for their mistakes and miscalculations have to be handled differently. Every political party in that country registered new or old. I have, I have my observation. And this observation was written two years ago and they are valid today. And the outcome has been seen. This is the situation we have. Now, if people did not understand the debacle of the APRC, I said it here <laughs> that Yaya is the ultimate holder of APRC. He is APRC. Just as Jawara was PPP. The popularity of Jawara carries the PPP. The incumbency in government carried PPP. This is the difference from Rollins. This is the difference from Rollins. That's why when Rollins left, the party continued. Just as um, I mean, NCP just disappeared. Because of Sirif Diva cannot hold on to the party or any other party. We have to recognize the strength. Now, what came out from the spokesperson? We know that. I said this. The executive of the APRC 
are doing this to continue to survive for their personal needs. The, the life they are accustomed to, they, can, they don't have the potential to do anything different. It's all about a hustle. Yaya Jame is holding on to the grassroots for, for his own safety, to, for, to, to have something to bargain with. But nobody can give Yaya Jame what he wants. Barak cannot give it. They tried everything. They negotiated everything. Yaya Jame was not satisfied. That's why Yaya Jame is not. That's why I said if any day Yaya Jame agrees, then Jame should be scared. But then that's, that would be a major. It's not about winning elections, but think out, outside the box. We are not surprised. But you can see again the selfishness of Barrow. We are supposed to be in a transition in order to map out, build foundation, consolidate on this peace, build, re reform our economy, reform our institutions, build in a private, I mean, I mean, independent institutions, I mean, to be effective and everything else. He disregarded everything. He doesn't care about anything. He wants it this way. Everything with Barrow and his wealth and everything and now he is desperate because of his seeing the door out in December now he's ready to do anything he tried everything with Jame didn't work now he's taking what he thinks he can yes from the political bureau of the APRC they sp sponsor to giving them allowance he did and everything else are you surprised but again it tells you something about Barrow and anybody who supports Barrow then what did we fight for I don't have a problem individuals deciding to move from one party to another. But you don't want to take the, 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 the structure and entirety of that party. What are you telling people? What are we telling people? What does he represent? Nothing. He has not reformed the armed forces. He has not reformed the civil service. He, has not, he, ha he cannot build a political party. Didn't I say this here? That Barrow cannot build a political party. Didn't I say this here or since two years ago? It's proven now. What he's doing, he's taking everything. Now, NRP is just gone. Now cannot be even recognized anymore. Who is in NRP? Because we all know what this party we are made of. I can go and tell you what I thought about NRP. I can tell you what I thought about all these parties. And I might be tempted to do that. Let me see if I have them here. Um, <laughs> the NRP was formed and led by Ahmad Ba in nineteen ninety six at the end of the transition from the establishment of the um, I mean, establishment of this party. I have always had this doubt about the genuineness of the party. I did not believe they were, they were an authentic political party. I thought the real motive was to serve in helping the dictator entrench himself. I have evidence and comprehensive report on how the party was formed and its activities. The party was established by the dictator to fulfill his de uh, divisive strategy by using tribal politics to split the votes and avoid a united uh, coalition with the dictator uh, and with the dictator knew was the realis realis realistic strategy to overthrow him. The party always take the second biggest share of the um, I mean, uh, of the of the opposition vote. Uh, uh, I mean, um, from the main opposition, the UDP. The party has always uh, delivered the wishes of the dictator until the dictator thought that it it was no more of use. I'm skipping some some report there because I don't want to mention the other bit. The NRP does not have uh, a well-known executive members or political structure. It's a proper, uh, if a proper audit was conducted by the IEC, the party would not have met the requirement to be registered as a political party. Everything about the party is centered on, on the party leader. It operates on the, on the same strategy as I don't want to touch the other things. And um, to continue to be sustainable, they need uh, invest, um, investors now. Ahmad Bahaf managed to stay in government and is likely to back Barrow in the coming elections if they are, uh, if they are able to reach a negotiation. This is even revealing as much as I didn't even realize. I, I made this caveat to bar, bar, uh, coming election if they are able to meet um, 
if they are able to meet uh, reach an uh, a negotiation the, the the party leader has associated himself closely with Barrow so much so that his survival can only be assured by staying with Barrow he is likely to lose the support from the constituencies he had on parliament uh, on, on parliamentary and local government election he 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 only manages to gain those seats under the help uh, 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 since under the help of the UDP tactical alliance they had during the 27 parliamentary and 28 local government elections. When analyzing the 2018 local government elections, the weakness of the NRP can be measured and continue to be exposed with prevailing realities like the poor performance of, of the borough administration. If one consider a, uh, a, a challenge from the UDP and likely uh, or likely of an anti-establishment party, there will be easily there will easily be an impact on the NRP and pockets of consequences controlled by the NRP and the GDC by using the non-traditional influences, the diaspora and the non-political influences, people that have never interested in politics but got inspired by an anti-establishment candidate. These are the observations for the this. These are important things. Why am I reading this? It's just again for the integrity of this program to say that we just i just don't jump on and make assertion i take my time use my expertise and even discuss these issues and come out with come out with a document that i can look at and reflect on and this document share with others for them to have their observation and give a feedback before i can be confident even to put it out in the public and i can tell you this document is shared into members of technically all the genuine opposition parties. All the genuine opposition parties, they have this document. It's important for the, every opposition party in order to level the playing field. That's my contribution. That's my contribution. If anybody can understand this, and you can establish yourself and position yourself and strategize to win. But this issue about the uh, APRC is going to disintegrate. Yaya is going to hold on to the base until Yaya see what is fit. We have to understand the ego of Yaya. Why would Yaya install Barrow? Tell me about that. Why would Yaya come and install Barrow? What did Barrow do for Yaya or not do for Yaya? No, Rambo and others will come and tell you everything and blame everybody else. They will never blame uh, um, but, but yeah, it's not stupid. Yeah, I know who got the executive power. Yeah, I know who oversaw. I mean, oversaw the 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 the, the, the seizure of his properties and 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 and, and who shared the properties. Yeah, I know about all this. They can make that. They are making a case in order to go and join them. They just want to go and I mean continue to loot our coffers to live that way. Because that's the only way. If these people don't do politics, what are they going to do? What was their life before politics? This is what we're going to ask. Now, it's up to you, Gambians, to think about it. Now, these are the people you want to determine your future? You are calling yourself to be smart, educated Gambian? You cannot choose from the political parties available? You cannot choose yourself? You cannot choose other people? You cannot come together to do anything to stop people like this to determine your future? You see, this is not between Barrow and UDP. This is between Barrow and us. If anyone said, look, I don't like Barrow and I don't want the UDP, why can't you like the PDOIS? Why can't you like CA? Why can't you like the GDC? That is an excuse. Because of, look, we are not even yet to elections. What would say the GDC cannot turn, I mean, I mean, transform and win elections? What would say the, uh, and other things cannot happen? No. They, this is the narrative they want. Some people are making this because they are benefiting from this government. They are benefiting from this corruption. They are looking at the immediate benefits they have. They don't think about the future. They don't think about unrest. They don't think con this con government is not sustainable the, the way it goes. Everybody does whatever they want. You have a no entity thrown out to call himself an al Kalo and make these statements and everything. Why do you think this is happening now? Because of just the government we have. Anybody can do anything. It's not an effective government. We don't mean a dictatorship. A government that works on policy. Now, you see, this, this is the stupidity again. We saw the um, vehicles at State House. Actually, 
when I published the two vehicles at State House, APRC vehicles, I I have confidence on my source that it was relevant. It was did Saturday. I put it out there. I had my distinct spot. I said, I put it out there. Two people contacted me. So, oh, no, I think this is an old one. I said, why? They pointed to things I thought. The vehicles are old vehicles and so on. And I withdraw the post straight away. And I posted to, to apologize. I said, look, that was wrong. But I went back to collaborate. But other people in, in box me. They said, no. We actually saw this vehicle um, somewhere in Banyun at the NPP headquarters in Banyun. And someone said to me, the NPP headquarters, the emblem is not uh, grey anymore, now it's green. I don't know what that means. They said that they saw the vehicles there. Other people said that they saw it at the State House. Other people to point to people who were in that picture they know. They said this is sad. Sad, sad have never served in State House in the Ayajama time. He's serving there. Someone pointed to another person. He said, I know that guy. He's a Senegalese Zanab. I came back and reposted it today. I knew about it yesterday. I left, left it to be cooled down. I came back and reposted it. But the interesting part about this is not only about the ships, um, the ships given to, Thomas Rams given to APRC. It's the vehicles. Now, we have evidence that then the vehicles impounded by rule court of law then by the justice ministry freezing the assets of APRC have been returned to the APRC how was that done I hope the opposition will go and ask no the opposition will not want to ask because they don't want to be seen as eliminating the APRC it's politics I understand that that's why we have the press I hope the press will go and ask these questions I tell you no opposition will go and ask these questions I understand it's politics Politics, that's what they are. That's why I said the press now, who is independent? So go and ask the question, how did they return these vehicles to APRC? Because it had to go through the due process. What else have been returned to the APRC that was frozen? The money given to the APRC, is it from the frozen accounts or not? You cannot just defreeze something and give it back without telling the people, because the justice came and told us that these properties are frozen. Now they well, how did they get this uh, point back? But again, we have seen this p p policy before. You see, this is why I respect Saudi Allah. This is why I like Saudi Allah. The gentleman was sophisticated. The gentleman was knowledgeable. Saudi Allah have never succumbed to the pressure to be given from his pocket or from anywhere directly to the people as if he was helping the people he knows that that's not true and it's not right i remember as a kid and i heard people saying ne jawar duy me so ko hole sax ñu ne duy amé xaliss duy me su su gëwëli ñëwé woyan ko sax ci naka di podium ministre yi ñoo dé gëné 5 dollars ci lool me wala mu lu fin duy amé xaliss duy me I have nothing wrong with individuals. You am saying yente, I'm saying taka, I'm saying female. But if you are the president, you talk at the function or wherever the state house, you represented the country. You cannot be seen as given to some and not others. If you have something to give of your own army, decide that give it to institutions or give it to personally to someone. But you cannot bring in groups, political party groups or other things and give it. It's not right. Why are they doing this? Because they see this in the Ajame. But the Ajame was even doing something far better, better in a way. I'm not encouraging it. But he was given, he was stealing from a social security, he was stealing from pensioners, taking their money, going and buy these things from, um, from Senegal and, and Mauritania, Tobaski, and sell it cheaper to the people. Now he was robbing the pensioners of their interests and everything else. That's what's wrong. But Barrow is trying to replicate the same thing. Barrow went and bought thousand, thousand um, lamb by the nephew. One of them is Amadou Onjaga. And they have to cross in the night, 2, 3 a.m., risking the ferry and everything else. And they crossed with this. And he went to the Daral and bought 400 more at 
in the report we have 100 was given to the APRC executive 100 that's what we heard now we heard from messages that APRC executive claimed to receive 20 where the discrepancy happened we don't know but we can categorically tell you from the NPP itself this is what they said who is lying is between them but we are giving you what we heard from them and we have the voice recording for that but now what happened apparently this 1,400 1, just was shared among stewardess among stewardess did not go to any needy they shared among themselves some of them got more, more than one this is what happened the corruption is the same thing Barrow thinks that he can be that way corrupt and allow corruption at every level and it will not affect anything he does now we have seen a video coming out now NPP members saying that they are not going to support NPP if they don't have a ram now how many members would NPP have to give a ram to it's not sustainable it's not real it's not true and tells you that everybody supports all the political parties I know are expecting support from their members donations and orders yes if they redistribute some of that into other parts fine but most of their money is coming from their members it's only NPP that have coffers coming from up going down and it doesn't reach down it stays there every money that have been distributed stayed out there and they've been enticing people to come and join them because of what they can get from from the party this is what they saw now the, why are we uh, surprised that people are saying that they don't have their tobacco Tobaski. Now, if they don't have Tobaski, they're not going to vote for Barrow or they're not going to support Barrow. Now they're panicking. Let them go and buy more and give it and see what's going to happen. But we all know <coughs> that's how the party is run. It's anything is about taking from us, taking the I mean, coffers from our coffers. Now, are we going to say that that's okay again? Are we going to continue to support that? Are we going to vote Barrow and acknowledge that this is okay? Because that's what it means. If we vote Barrow, that's we are okay with this. We have the power to bring about the change and vote for the right people. Vote for the right party. Vote for the right people to bring about the change. This is what's going to continue. You think after elections, Barrow will change the way he runs things? No. It's going to get worse. Because that's an approval that what he's been doing is right. And Gambe, I keep on reminding you. Every dictator or every failed politician, rest of the political party leaders, they live with, within us. They live within us. We all know where they live. It's not to their interest that country be destabilized. Barrow doesn't care. It's not to his interest, but he doesn't care. He's reckless. The guy is clueless. If that country is destabilized, he will not be affected because he doesn't care. Someone who cares would not wait for destabilization, would do something to avoid destabilization, but he is talking destabilization. He's ignoring the victims. He is supporting the perpetrators of crime. He is creating marginalization. He is not statements alone and more than that. He is creating, widening the gap, social inequalities. All this bring out destability. He doesn't care? No. The guy doesn't support bother about hot health care or anything we have seen healthcare system asking for gloves and basic necessity we have seen the schools and everything else does he ever care about that no but anything to do with somebody to support him you give your vehicle thousands of thousands of thousands of dollars and tell i mean i mean give political parties money and everything for his to stay and he doesn't care but if anything happens i tell you he, he's a coward he will not even go to a convoy to the airport yeah, they may did or other dictators done. He will be airlifted from state house and out of the country with his family and, and kids. We are the ones going to face the brunt. The political party leaders and their followers and us, a family. Our families will face the brunt. And who have more would have more to lose. Now it's up to us to wake up to this. This country, this country the way it's going, is not sustainable. Do something about that. The power is rest in your hands. Go and support the political parties that can bring about change. This thing cannot bring up. This is not change. This is a confirmation that Barrow cannot change that country, cannot transform that country. This is a continuity of the APRC government. It's glaring in your eyes. If Barrow can have Jammeh to endorse him today, he will do that. He tried everything he can. 
Now, he, the best thing he can do is to take the executive. The executive will, I'm not saying the entire executive will come, but most of them will come. Because who are they? We know who they were. We know what they've been. Now, we expect that we don't know their future. We know what they're going to do. How many of them are genuinely following this thing? You think any genuine person would be an executive of an APRC party? There's something must be wrong with that person. But it's up to us. And everything else, this guy would disregard rule of law, would disregard everything and, and just to do it, to, to say in power. We have seen the backlash coming in many quarters. NRP now, we don't hear NRP. And if anybody listen to the clown, uh, Gomez of and GPDC and others, we all know. I can tell you what I think about those parties. Let me tell you. Not only him, them, them parties I said. Let me tell you what the, I thought about the NCP. The real NCP was eliminated during the transition. The, their late leader, Honorable Mustafa Diba, uh, used, used the party at the latter part of his life to prop up the dictator. Since his demise, the other actors are using the party for the same purpose. The party ha uh, had a similar fate as the PPP. No known functional executive branch and run by a few individuals inter interested in uh, I mean, preserving and profile, uh, uh, profiting from the funds given by the dictator. They have no real political constituency and their previous support base had been consumed by the APRC and UDP. They held few political rallies, contested few election al alliance with the dictator, but also no significant presence in the political discourse apart from serving as a wedge within the within the opposition which directly helped the dictator entrench himself and continue to loot and repress the gambian people the party too had held a sham congress in november 2018 and end up end up having two leaders one held by majan majan kosamusa and the other led by i believe mr bojan the state of the party is in limbo majanko is milking any little uh, uh, relevance of the party, they are angling and supporting Baro uh, to benefit from the corruption. Um, they have no grassroots and no elected representative. The only nominated member they have is Majanko uh, in, in parliament. He will only maintain his seat in the term of his this parliament. They have zero political capital. They will fail the IEC audit if IEC happen to carry out any credible exercise. The Gambia Moral Congress and the Gambia uh, Party for Democracy and Progress, GPT, GPT, I don't know. The two parties controlled by the political corn artists, both established in the same manner in the diaspora during the dictatorship. The GMC is led by Mary Ahmad Fati and GPDC led by Henry Gomez. The two parties are different um, sides of the same coin. I named them the cyber parties as their presence was only noticeable on social media. The party were legally registered but were literally just in existence on paper. I still do, do not understand how, the, how they, could, uh, they could have been registered a political party as they had not fulfilled the primary requirements to qualify for registration. Both party leaders live outside of the Gambia with no uh, known resident status to, the, uh, to be eligible as a candidate. That was then I mean. Their members in the executive are not known by the people. The GMD, GPDC had his wife uh, as deputy party leader. Uh, uh, party leader. The GMC leader was the only known figure in the party. He is astute in the way he kept moving around the 20, 20 people he had on the ground attending events as, as, as his representative. They had never held political rallies or national political conferences. Congress, GMC had one symbolic, gone, uh, symbolic Congress um, gone into an alliance with the UDP contesting in presidential elections. Both parties contested the 27 primary and 2018 local local government elections without winning uh, uh, on, on both elections and even maintaining their pledge uh, pledge on any of the polls held. They, they, they both 
held sham party congresses and in, uh, introduced nothing new apart from the meeting uh, uh, meeting the registration um, mandate the parties operate from one reason uh, um, for one reason only to, to serve the personal interests of their leaders Henry is hanging hanging to borrow whilst Mike is angling for the UDP to form an alliance this coming uh, this time round. They are both toxic and carry no value of political capital. They will fail the IC audit if uh, IC happens to carry out a credible exercise. This is what we have on the ground. We all know the genuine political parties or credible political parties. Now, can we not go and rally behind the political, genuine political parties? Or credible political parties why do we have to have option on on the table of the uh, npp npp is not a party if a proper audit was conducted the npp would not pass they and we have seen the same they conducted to have a interim an interim how can a government struggle to have a, 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 a an executive a established an, a, a, ex executive how much time did they have now all the so-called coalition there's no party in coalition with them and NRP is gone, uh, GPDC and PPP is no party and all the parties, we all seen it, it's facts, I predicted this two years ago. But not only that, now the APRC, people say, stop saying the APRC, say the executive of the APRC. And do you, do you have made it clear, he is going, regardless of what, it's not based on the executive decisions. And we know that the executive is controlled by BIA yeah, and if they, if they, if they rebel, they go alone. They cannot take the grassroots. But Barrow can will settle for anything because he's broke in in in, in, uh, in capacity to mobilize. Now we have seen. Can you can you realize what happened? Now Bar uh, Demme is going round to insulate his party grassroots by sending his 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 uh, um, his secondary what um, executive in order to go to the constituencies to, to call on to the constituency structures people that know know but uh, Jamme is buying colonels going back to these people appealing to them to hold back so that this executive cannot take anything from them now this executive will go to borrow with what now they will try to go and contest to get the grassroots and most of the grassroots are made of different segments and some of those segments have complete loyalty Yes, you will cox question and some of this loyalty is not based on tribe. I'm telling some of them are fullers, some of them are jollas, some of them are mandinka, some of them are wolf and other tribes. Because for one reason, some have benefited and think that Jame is the ultimate person they need to support. That's our, their understanding. That's why I'm appealing to political parties. Go out there, appeal to the people to come and join you. These people are Gambians. We should not have any conflict with the APRC members. They, they are part of our family. They, we come from the same environment, same ho homes. Why can't we speak to them? J Jame is no more, it's not going to be relevant. And I'm telling you, Gambia will be lucky in fact to bring Jame to justice. Right now, I'm telling you this, Jame is not well. He has never been well, but he's deteriorating, he's affected. But Jamie has the ego. He will not come and tell that to his followers. Jamie want to hold on to his followers. Up to when this situation arises, probably they as a destabilize something, then his party would be relevant in the discussion and negotiating table, and his issue would be bring up for settlement. Let us not fall for this. Let's disassociate Jame from the APRC. And there's nothing like APRC anymore. It's disintegrated. Go out there and appeal. Political party, tell them your policies. Tell them why they should join you. Disassociate them with Barrow. Barrow cannot turn from anything. And let them not use anything that happened in the past. What's come out of the TRRC, it's not nothing to do. With, with, with anybody else but for people that committed those crimes and the loss of the Gambia and we should respect that and we need an effective transition and an effective transition is not only about prosecution it's not only reparation to the people but we need social projects to invest in because collectively Gambians have been, I mean, I mean, been, been victims economically and these social projects are things that will bring people together
Those, these are the points that the opposition should be going out there to tell them. Not to appeal to anyone based on tribe or anything. Appeal to them based on issues that they uh, matters to them. Tell them about your agriculture. Tell them about your transformation of agriculture. Tell them about other things. Tell them, you know what they engage in. Go there and tell them. This is what we need. We don't have to be different. We don't. We don't, we, we see examples in South Africa. We see example other places. We see example in Guinea Bissau when they use tribe uh, to build their I mean platforms and everything. Thank you guys and have a good day. Thank you.